extreme case where they are the same, then this such a factor would vanish. So there is a built-in repulsion in this model. But now there is, there is some other repulsion due to some fixed charges that you, you pick on, on again on the unit sphere. Uh, they are like R plus one of them. I use R as, as this parameter in this model. They're located on the sphere somewhere and um, and they come with some uh, uh, charges, A0 up to AR, which are positive numbers. And each uh, external charge here uh, repels the, uh, has a repelling force on, on all the other free charges, which is reflected by this extra product, this extra factor in this product, right? And it comes with a exponent to n a k, which also you see an n here, which means that it's also growing with n. So the repulsion um, uh, gets stronger if you increase the number of points. And that's sort of to create a balance between the repulsion due to these external uh, charges and, and the inner repulsion fr from the n free charges. And so we, uh, we were, uh, Juan and I, we were sort of interested in this model, uh, also because of a paper by uh, Johan Brauchardt, uh, Peter Dragnev, who I happily saw in the audience, at Seth and, and Rob Wormersley, where they analyzed this, this model, uh, actually the ground state here, which I will do as well, just the, the, the point configuration that, that minimizes here this, this expression. And they observe that in the large n limit, uh, these fixed charges that you have on the on the on the sphere, like here and here, and here as well, right? And maybe some other in, in, that you don't see. Um, they create around them a, a region that's free from the free charges, free from the xj's, right? And and they also observe that if if these uh, these ak's, so the the charges that are at these uh, that you have, the, the amount of charge that you have at at the, at, the, at these fixed locations, if that these are small enough numbers, then these regions are just spherical caps, right? And they were able to create such nice nice figure that I stole from their paper um, here, um, right? And so you see what happens. And then, they, but I also observed that if these um, that these a case are are getting larger, there's more repulsion, repulsion right, from these uh, fixed charges. Then these um, uh, disjoint spherical caps they may first come together, right? They have the, the 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 union, eh? Sorry. Uh, Okay, that's nothing. And, and I and, think it was just someone that was accidentally unmuted, that's all. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got it, yeah. Um, and if you increase further, then they may just overlap, right? And then, but then the whole picture gets deformed. It's no longer a union of, of spherical caps, but it's some other um, figure that here that you get, which is free from the charges, right? And, and the region that's that is occupied by the free charges is no longer uh, the complement of, of disks, of, of spherical caps. And then the question is, what is it? Can we characterize it, this region with the, with the free charges, which is then known as the droplet, right? And so um, that is um, our goal to describe or say something sensible about these these regions that you get in this in this in the situation. Another source of motivation is another model, which is known as the, the complex Ginebra ensemble with a um, with an external source, and the Ginebra matrix itself, uh, which I already. Uh, came up in this work with from Krishnapur actually. So it's um, a, a random matrix with uh, complex Gaussian entries and all, uh, all, in, all independent. These points in the complex plane um, also have a nice, uh, an explicit distribution uh, for their eigenvalues. 
So if you take eigenvalues of such a Geneva matrix and you scale properly the, due to this n, right? Then you may get a, you get a point distribution like this, uh, which is sort of, sort of similar as the one that we saw on the, on the sphere, except there is this extra factor here, which in this case sort of prevents these uh, points from going to infinity. And actually in the large n limit and with this scaling here, these, these uh, eigenvalues will fill out uh, a disk, a unit disk actually, with a constant density. And then you can make a modification of, of this uh, model um, where you again put in some extra factors that you think of as due to some coming from some external uh, charges, right? Or yeah, some points denoted you know, QK here, and they repel these uh, uh, other charges here. There's again, there's a repelling uh, uh, phenomenon here in this uh, among these uh, eigenvalues with a similar nature as, as here. And, and this was studied in detail for the case uh, where there's one external charge like this in a paper by Balogh, Bertola, Lee and McLaughlin, a very nice paper. They made a connection with orthogonal polynomials in the complex plane, um, which is in the background here. They are, but they can, could also reduce this uh, to orthogonality on a contour which is very useful to get asymptotic results. So they could analyze this model in pretty much detail. And they found uh, in particular this, this droplet in this model also has a number of phase, as a phase transition here, where you may have, um, if, if, if the repulsion is, is not, if A is small, you should start here actually, this location of this, external charge is inside the unit disk and you have some uh, repelling uh, region around it. And it, it initially it's, uh, it's just a, a disk and the disk may touch the outer boundary, which is also a disk. And then the, the, and then the shape is deformed to some, what they call a, a bratwurst, right? Or, or a banana. Okay depending on what you want to look, uh, what, you, what, what you want to see here. Um, so that's again, that's the second source of, um, of motivation that, that we had to, um, to try and see if also in the model coming from the sphere, we could actually find orthogonal polynomials and maybe even um, orthogonal polynomials on, on contours or a generalization here that's relevant if you have more than one external source, which goes by the name of, of multiple orthogonal polynomials. So that actually has not been successful yet to the extent uh, yeah, that I'm happy with that. I mean, that's, it doesn't quite work that nicely. And I, so I'm not going to report on these things that didn't quite work, but I will tell you what we could do. And this has to do actually only with the large n limit. So we, I'm not going to, I'm not, not able to say too much about the finite n case uh, yet. But still this finite n case is, uh, gives us some hint what is the structure that um, is, um, there's an extra structure here in the form of a so-called uh, mother body. So what is that? So as I, as I, as I was saying, the, in this model uh, coming from this uh, random matrix model with external source, um, you can look at uh, this, uh, what's known as the average characteristic polynomial, right? So you have your GJs, which are the eigenvalues of some random matrix. This is then the characteristic polynomial. And if you average over your probability measure, you get the average characteristic polynomial. It's again, a monic polynomial of degree uh, N. And, and so you may also wonder what happens to this polynomial and in particular, what happens to their zeros. And what's the curious thing here is that these zeros, they tend to go to a one dimensional curve. They, 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 they don't fill out such a domain, such a droplet, but they concentrate uh, and in the larger limit, they, they tend to um, 
to, to a, a, a curve here, which is located inside the, the, the droplet. It doesn't come to the boundary here, although the picture may seem to suggest that. Actually, it comes very close and you don't see it with the eye. This is sort of a real life uh, uh, picture, but it's not, it's not coming really to the boundary. So it stays inside. Actually, in the critical situation where this, uh, where you these, have these two tangent uh, circles, then there's another circle in, in, in blue there where the zeros are. And they, they, then they are tangent also at this, uh, they also come to this point of tangency. And so that was um, uh, also actually done in this uh, paper by Barloch and, and, and company. And it was also elaborated uh, on in, in work of Li and Yang for the case where there's more external uh, sources, uh, more points Q here. And it's not orthogonal polynomials, but uh, on contours, but multiple orthogonality. And the power of that is that you then have powerful tools like the riemann hilbert problem that you can use to get asymptotic behavior for the polynomials. And then you can calculate this mother body. But actually the way the analysis goes in the other direction in, in a way, you first, they first had to identify this curve. That was part of the game to identify this curve. And then they were able to, um, uh, together with a certain probability measure on it, which would describe the limit of the, of the, of the, of the zeros of these um, polynomials in, in um, and that is then the an ingredient to make the, this riemann hilbert analysis work. In the long-term project is to be able to do something like this also for this model with, with more external sources and also from the model coming from the sphere. Okay, but again, this is not, uh, uh, this is work in progress. Okay, so we're going to talk in this, uh, I'm going to talk in this uh, presentation about uh, the, the large and limit only. Um, and that has to do, of course, with the potential theory. And I guess many people are familiar with, uh, with potential theory in this audience. Okay, oh, say, sorry about this. A, it doesn't fill the screen properly. So we go back to this uh, model from the sphere, right, with these external charges and um, the, the, the charges here are modeled by a probability measure, sigma, which is a discrete measure located at these external charges um, with the strengths uh, AK here. So that's a discrete measure located at these R plus one points. And then this limiting distribution that you have uh, for the free charges is a uh, noted mu sub sigma. It will depend on this sigma. And this is a, the unique probability measure that uh, is sort of an equilibrium when you have these external charges, right? And it means that in terms of the logarithmic potential, which is written here, but you can see here, here, here is the absolute value of the, of X minus Y, or actually the, the, the Euclidean distance X minus Y is written here. Sorry about that, right? But I guess most of you have seen these things in one way or another. So the potential due to the, um, the free charges together with the potential created by the, the, the discrete charges here should be a constant then on the droplet. And it will be equal, uh, it will be uh, greater than or equal to the same constant on, on the rest of the sphere. These um, uh, equations will and inequalities will will, will characterize this uh, limiting distribution mu sigma and what is known is actually that there is such a min it will come you can also set up a minimization problem here and there's a unique uh, a minimizer that will satisfy these conditions and it's but it's actually um, a, a rather simple this um, measure is mainly, it's just the, Le, the Lebesgue measure uh, normalized to have total mass uh, one, but restricted to this droplet, right? So you, this lambda denotes the 
normalized Lebesgue measure on the, on the unit sphere. And with a D there, it means the restriction to this uh, domain. So th the message here is that you should be looking for this uh, droplet, it, the support of the measure, and then automatically you also know what is the measure. It's just a uniform measure on, on, the, on the droplet. Right? Okay. Now, this mother body, we also expect this mother body uh, to play a role, and this is actually the way that we, we approach this, this, uh, this problem is to um, uh, look at this other measure, but it will be concentrated on a one dimensional set, just on a, on a system of contours. And that should be in such a way that it creates the same potential. This, this other body is actually a measure, sigma star here located on a one dimensional subset, which should be such that it creates the same potential in the exterior up, up to a constant. Right? This is what's written in this first uh, identity here. This is again, the potential of the, uh, the equilibrium measure on, on, on the droplet. Um, so they, they should be up to this constant. They should be the same in the exterior here. And they should have, and there should be an inequality like this on the droplet itself. Because the, you, you, this mother body measure is, is co more concentrated, so it will have a bigger potential by itself. And, and that's sort of the intuition here behind this inequality. Uh, so Juan and I, we first analyzed this problem for the case of uh, two points on the two external charges on the, on the unit sphere. And we took the, 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 the amount of charges to be the same. Um, and of course, if then these charges are, 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 are small, then you get the result of, of Prokhart and company that the droplet is just a complement of a union of, of two uh, spherical caps. But we were able to identify and uh, make a guess about what is the mother body measure. Um, so what we did actually was to project the problem from the unit sphere to the complex plane by means of stereographic projection. And then, yeah, the intuition is that this mother body measure in this, in this symmetric situation with two charges will be located here with this dotted line here. It will be on some meridian that separates the two points, right? So we made our stereographic projection that this meridian would go to the real line um, and the North Pole is here. So that, that goes to inf infinity. And then after projection, we made an, an ansatz and a guess what uh, that this mother body measure should be an equilibrium problem, an, an equilibrium measure in terms of of some external field that would uh, on, on the um, on, on the real line, for which there's much theory there and many examples, and so we could make it, we were able to make a guess about what the external field should be, right? Based also on the projections of these external sources here onto the complex plane, so they should definitely come into the picture, of course. And then from there, we, we identify this, this, this measure, this equilibrium measure, this mother body. And from there, we were able to identify a domain and a two dimensional domain, which after projection back onto the, onto the sphere, we could indeed ident prove these identities and inequalities here that you want this one and the one from the, from the previous slide here. Okay, so we made a lucky guess or educated guess, right? And from there, we could go on and, and prove these things. And what was sort of um, a bit of a surprise to us that um, in this model, this droplet, um, or actually the complement of the droplet is 
projected onto an ellipse, right? So this, this domain here, if you do a stereographic projections, it becomes an ellipse. Or actually the boundary here is the boundary of an ellipse. So that's sort of a simple curve and that sort of, yeah, gives, shows what this region here is in this case. Okay, um, now in this uh, paper that is in the archive uh, this year, um, we, we were able to generalize this um, to the case of um, uh, an arbitrary number of points, but we had to impose enough symmetry in order to get, uh, to get a handle on, to get a grip on, on the geometry of the problem. So we could, do, we could analyze the following situation. So these R plus one points here, they are located symmetrically around the North Pole on the unit sphere, meaning they have the same uh, uh, latitude, right? They are on the, um, and on this circle then, then there, they are located also with equal distance, right? So they, um, that's our situation. And also the, the, the amount of charge that you have at each, uh, uh, ex external uh, source here, th th they're all the same. So th there's a rotation symmetry then in an R plus one fold rotation symmetry. This situation uh, we could handle because then because of the symmetry, it we could sort of, it, it's sort of uh, obvious that the mother body, whatever it is, but it should be then you remember this measure that's located on, on a one dimensional set. Um, that should then be supported on the number of meridians, R plus one meridians going from the, the North Pole to the South Pole, right? That just separate these two, um, that, that separate all these uh, PJs, right? So if you do stereographic projection, then you get um, this picture. And I, I do, I'm drawing pictures for the case R is two. Okay, so that means that R plus one is three. Right? So you have three um, uh, of those points on the sphere and they project to say points that are in these uh, holes here. Oh, okay, <laughs> what happened there? Um, and you, the meridian here would then be uh, projected to these uh, half rays here. This is the origin here and um, and this is then the picture that you would get for the case when these external char these charges here are small. The number A here that is, is small enough so that you have disjoint uh, spherical caps on, on, this, on, the disc, on, the, on the sphere which project onto disjoint circles here. But if you then increase uh, with these, these, these charges, uh, the amount of charge at then there's more repulsion, right, from, from each of them. And then these uh, disks will grow. They become tangent, like in this situation. And the mother body is still this connection of half rays. But then um, if you still go on, then it's no longer the case, right? And then um, you have a situation like this, uh, which on the sphere means that the droplet is now, well, the droplet is now, uh, has two components. This component is from the region around the South Pole, and the outer region here is from is around the North Pole, which looks much bigger than the one here. But that's just a visual effect coming from the stereographic projection, right? So if you think about these charges, external charges to being in the Northern Hemisphere, then if you increase further, it will mean that there's a next uh, transition when also the region around the North Pole disappears. The droplet around the North Pole then disappears completely and you only have what remains is this uh, region around the South Pole which is projected to a region around zero and then it looks like this. This is magnified picture compared to this one, okay? This is the picture where 
there's nothing here anymore. There's, again, the droplet now is uh, simply connected. Um, so that's sort of the picture that we have. And this is indeed what we were able to prove, that there are these two transitions that is reflected in, in, in the droplet, but it's also reflected in this mother body. The mother body here is these three uh, half rays, or actually that the measure that's located on the three half rays. And there's, in this situation, this measure will have, will have a density and the density will, will, will be zero here at this critical point, these points of tangency. And then if you go on, there's a breaking here of the support in the mother body. Let's look here on the positive half line. And, this, and the support here of the mother body is, uh, yeah, has uh, this, this gap here, right? And then if you go on, then this, this piece here will then eventually disappear. And you only have the mother body, these three, uh, segments here inside the droplet. Okay, so this is the picture and we we're able to prove this, right? Um, okay, so how are we able to prove this? What's our approach? So the approach is that we, just as in the case of two external uh, charges, we first make an educated guess about the mother body. This mother body should satisfy, which, which we know is located, what well, we expect is located on, uh, on these uh, half rays. Um, we will first set up an equilibrium problem that whose minimizer it gives this, um, this mother body, but it will be a vector equilibrium problem, right? So that's um, the, the thing. And, and actually for, it will be convenient for us first to undo, to remove the symmetry, right? Because in this setup, it was all uh, sym symmetric over rotations, R, R plus one fold symmetry. We remove this by, in the complex plane we are by mapping Z to Z to the R plus one, right? So then these R plus one half rays, these three of them here are all got mapped to the positive half line. And so then we're looking for, uh, and after this mapping, this mother body will be some measure then on the positive half line that we want to characterize first. Once we have the good candidate, we, we go back by introducing the symmetry again. And then if we want mapping it back to the sphere. So we're, we're focusing on, on the situation now where we are on zero to infinity. And then, yeah, we expect these three cases to happen, right? That this, the, this mother body is supported on an interval from zero to some, something, or on a disjoint union of two intervals, one with zero, the other one going to infinity, or we, want, we expect to have the whole half line, the full half line. And we use these acronyms, right? That we like to use here, this, this, and this, the bounded interval support case, two interval support, or the full interval support case. Okay, just to, uh, this terminology will be used, we will use it. And now, now comes the, yeah, the, this, the thing here. And this is a bit, a bit maybe a bit scary uh, expression here. So this is actually what will dust, what, what will, do the job for us. And so, yeah, we were quite fortunate to find this one. So what we have here, we have here an energy functional, some expression depending on our measures. That's this vector character that we have in this equilibrium measure that we have in this equilibrium problem. The mu one, let me tell you already in advance, will be the main character that we're after. That will be this mother body measure after removing the symmetry. But there are this uh, R plus one other measures that are also important for the equilibrium problem. So let's have a look. What do we have? We have these expressions involving the logarithmic energy, right? So this is this double integral with the logarithmic kernel and two measures, that's the mutual energy of these two measures. And if mu and nu, if you take them to be the same, this is the logarithmic energy of mu. 
And this is probably some notion that many of you will have seen in, in some form. So here you get these energies of these individual measures. That's, and we add them up, right? And this gives an inner repulsion. Each measure here has an inner repulsion. They like to spread out, right? To, to reduce, because we, we are going to minimize this, um, this function. Then there is some interaction between neighboring measures here in this sequence. You see mu j and mu j plus one, right? And so there is this mutual energy, which means that there is some interaction between neighboring measures in this sequence, but it comes with a minus sign, which means that there's no attraction, or so there's, there's no attraction. The two neighboring measures in this sequence, they attract each other. Um, and then there is some extra terms here involving some other logarithmic expressions acting on mu one and this one acting on mu r. So there is something acting on mu one on the first measure, which comes from some logar. If you think again about logarithmic interaction, there is some delta measure, direct measure at minus q inverse, which is on the negative axis. But with a, with a term here that the t is a parameter here in a model that's between zero and one. So this is altogether some negative number. And here there is another term which acts on the mu r. The same, yeah, with a different uh, prefactor. Okay, so this is what it is. I'm, I'm, I, I cannot expect you that to, to uh, understand all the details here. And what's even more, we're going to minimize this among certain measures that are also specific. Namely, they are supported either on the positive half line or on the negative half line. And they alternate. So mu one is on the positive real line, mu two on the negative, mu three again on the positive. So they alternate between that. And there is also a, re a demand, there's also here a condition on the total masses of each of these measures. They have, they come in an arithmetic progression if J goes from one to R, right? You see here with the mu one is actually a probability measure. And as I said, already that's the main character that we're after. And the other measures, they come, they have, in, they have the, the, their total masses uh, are, are, are bigger. They come, yeah, they follow this arithmetic progression with a one over T is, uh, could be a big number if T is uh, uh, small. Let me say that this T has to do with, um, in, in the end of the day, this T has to do with the total charge that you have, uh, that you have in, in your um, external charges. And if T is small, the external charge is, is big. So there's an inverse proportion. I mean, not exactly inverse proportional, but there's a, if T goes up, the, what's called A goes down. And Q, this parameter Q has to do with the location of, of these points on the sphere, right? The external charges. Um, okay, so what, how can we, so this is now our main result, I mean, uh, the, the first part of it. And I, okay. So the first thing is that there is a unique minimizer here. Okay, this factor equilibrium problem is known as, is, is to be weakly admissible. And okay, there's some general theory about this. There is a unique minimizer. Um, what we're after this, this mu one, right? That's the, the main character, the main, uh, character in the game. This has a support that could have these three shapes that we uh, that we um, expect, right? Either an interval from zero to somewhere or a disjoint union or, the, or, a, or a full real line. Um, and so that is the potential theory that that we use to to to, to 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 get these parts A and B. 
Then once we have the mu one and its support, um, then we know actually more. That this mu one, because it comes from this minima, from this vector equilibrium problem, it creates more structure together with these other measures that are in the background. And actually, it's this is a, it, the, the Cauchy transform of, of this measure will turn out to be an algebraic function. And so it's convenient to put a t here and to subtract this simple rational function in the parameter z. And this turns out to be an algebraic function of degree r plus one. So it, you can visualize it uh, as being defined on an... Um, so it, it will satisfy um, an algebraic equation of degree r plus one. And it lives on a Riemann surface which will be important for our analysis. Okay, that's one thing. This function phi is then um, the next step to get to our droplet, right? Because now we have um, a candidate for the, for the mother body, but what is now the candidate for the droplet? Well, this is, um, if you, we, we are able to show that there is a domain U in this complex plane that we're working, um, which uh, contains this uh, the support of this measure mu one. And the boundary of this domain is characterized by an equation like this, involving this algebraic function. So z times phi is some expression here involving absolute value of z and some peculiar exponent. And that's actually what we like. And if we then use this domain U, uh, let me show you some picture. This is actually the picture of U. I mean, this is in, this, uh, in the case where the support of the measure is an interval from zero to something, the bounded interval, this bis case, then you get a U like this, the shaded region. In the case, the this case, when you have two interval support, this, this region U also has two components. And the boundary is these two uh, closed curves, right? And in the, in the fifth case, you have a domain U, which is the, the exterior domain here in the shaded region. And then if you introduce the symmetry again, right? The R plus one fold symmetry, and you transform this domain U, uh, which will also has R plus one fold symmetry, and then if you move it back to the sphere, you indeed get a droplet, right? That's, that means that we have to, to prove this, we have to check all these in equations and inequalities. Well, two equations and two inequalities, right? Which means that we have to satisfy, um, we have to verify certain equations and inequalities at this level as well. And, and this identity here, it corresponds to the fact that in some sense that z times phi acts like a Schwarz function um, for this problem. Some, uh, you have, you don't have, um, yeah, or, or phi, I should say phi itself. So phi itself after transforming back will give us some function that will act as a, as a Schwarz function for this problem. And this is another ingredient that makes it problem work, makes the proof work, right? So here again, um, this is then the, 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 the final statements of, of, of our result. We introduce the symmetry again in this way, right? We have, once we have this U domain, we come to this, what we call omega. Um, that's by, uh, and that we map back to the sphere and this will give us a droplet D. And and the parameter Q is then related to the, the gives us the points on, on, on the sphere. Namely, um, the Q is a number bigger than, uh, less than one. We take this negative exponent here, negative power or negative uh, root actually. Um, and then we get a radius and the points, equidistant points on this, on this uh, radius bigger than one will then give us the points on the sphere. Um, and, and the charges are, are 
determined by this parameter t here in this way, right? As you see, if t increases from zero to one, this parameter a will go down from infinity to zero. And then we're able to prove all the necessary uh, equations and inequalities. And this is how we prove that um, this measure mu one gives us after transforming back the, the mother body. And, and these pictures indeed characterize uh, the droplet, right? And, and the, and the complement of the droplet. Okay, now I have five minutes to talk about the proof. Okay, so I'll have to skip uh, some parts of it. I already, um, right, so let me, maybe for this audience, the potential theory is the, is, the, is the more important. I mean, there's also the algebraic geometry related to this Riemann surface, which is important, but maybe for this audience, the, the potential theory is more appealing. Okay, so there is a, there is a minimizer. Okay, it's weakly admissible, okay. Weakly admissible because these other measures, mu2, et cetera, they don't have a compact support. Actually, the mu1 may also have an unbounded support. Um, so if you have an admissible equilibrium problem in the language of uh, the Book of Sesventotic, for example, you would have a minimizers with, with bounded support, but here they have unbounded support. And in particular, these other measures have full support, right? Either the negative or the positive half line. And they are actually obtained as balayage measures. So for those that know what it means, right? I mean, you take mu, if you're interested in mu k, right? You take the, the neighboring measures in the sequence, mu k minus one and mu k plus one, they're on the other half line and you balayage that to the support of mu k or, or, or to the half line where mu k is supported. And then with a factor two, this gives us uh, two times mu k, right? That's um, one thing you get out of this e equilibrium problem. Now the, another curious, let's not talk about this uh, because of in time, um, there was another interpretation of mu one. Uh, if you're interested, please ask, but uh, let's look at this. The measure mu one, you may also obtain it as an, a balayage measure, but of, of, this, uh, of this one. So you have this mu two, which is on the negative half line. And this measure is a delta measure located at minus Q. So also on the negative half line, but with a coefficient, which is negative. Remember this T is less than one. So this is actually a negative measure that you may balayage onto the positive half line. And mu two is a, a positive measure that you balayage onto the positive half line. In total, you get something with total mass one, but it need not be positive, right? But if it is positive, then it is actually the mu one. And it happens in the full interval support case, right? So in, in the case when the, if you go back to the sphere, we have disjoint spherical caps. But this is the initial uh, observation to prove these, uh, to get our hands on the support of mu one in the general case, namely these, now it's four cases in general, may also have an interval from a positive number to infinity. And we use an, a method that uh, I developed uh, already 20 years ago or more even with Peter Dragnev that we call the iterated balayage measure uh, algorithm, which means that we start from this expression, this balayage measure, but we're in a situation now where it's not positive, but it's partly negative. The total mass is one, so there's, a, there's more positive than negative. Uh, but still there's some negative part and this we don't like this negative part. Then we can put this, take this negative part and balayage it to the support of the positive part. That's what this balayage algorithm does. Since we balayage some negative pieces onto a positive 
measure, although this is part of a positive measure, the, the, the measure there goes down, but somewhere it may again be neg become negative. Wherever it's negative, we continue and make another step in this balayage algorithm to move whatever is negative there, we move it to the positive side and we go on. And this, okay, this balayage algorithm is, okay, that's what it is. But we're able to analyze this in this situation and say that we, because of the special structure that we have in this equilibrium problem, it's a bit delicate, but we are able to do it, that we keep this structure of the support of the positive part throughout this algorithm. Each step of the algorithm respects this, this, these, four, these four possibilities are there and no more than that. And also in the limit then, we keep this po, uh, po, po, these two up, these, these possibilities. So that's actually a, a main step in the proof. This is also important that certain uh, prop, uh, uh, notions vary in a, in a monotonic way in terms of the parameter t. That's another important ingredient for our proof. I will not go further on this. And then this Riemann surface, but I'm, I'm out of time already, so um, I will not uh, talk about it, right? We, we, we use these supports of the measure to, to create a Riemann surface, and, and then this meromorphic function is there. Um, and then, then we go on, as I as was stated in the, in, the, in, the, in the statement of the theorem, to create this domain U, which has this, that we can characterize in this way. That's again, a pretty delicate calculation, actually. It's a, a bit of a miracle if you believe in miracles. Um, but I'm at a Catholic university, right? So I'm allowed to believe in miracles. And so, um, and then you can go on and uh, you prove, we prove the thing, right? So that's um, basically it. <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's all. So thank you for your attention and thanks again for the invitation uh, to speak here. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, questions and remarks? Has somebody questions? Um, yes, perhaps if I even may. Uh, just hi, wonder hi. about the. Hi there, how are you doing? Um, so if you go, perhaps go a couple of slides back where you show the the cases of this. Yes. No. Oh, here, um, here, there, there, this, the four cases. Yes, this one, this one, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, this 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 case, right? The second case where you have these yeah. two intervals joined. I just wonder. So x one and x two. Is there, is there some uh, special connection to it? Can you say something about the distance between those two is, or is this something that that might just be an arm? Um, yeah, they come off from this algebraic equation, right? So the, mm -hmm. there's, yes. a, there's one parameter family here, there. Um, now we cannot say that one is the reciprocal of the other or something. Um, mm -hmm. um, no, I, in our paper, we don't have any uh, statements about that. Okay. Yeah. Could be something, but um, yeah, we did not uh, think about that. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you. So, I, I don't know, I have a question. Oh, sorry, it's Norm, how are you doing? Hi, Norm. <laughs> nice nice talk. <laughs> um, how did you um, guess or, or come up with that energy functional of the, of the R measures, mu1? Yeah, yeah mu very R. good question. Yeah. Um, okay. Then I have to go back to this picture uh, here, uh, this picture, yeah. So we we sort of um, had, had this in mind, right? This, this is a picture that, uh, and this actually um, reminded me of a picture that you also get in the normal matrix model with external source. This is not the same as this uh, um, Ginebra with external source, but it's another model that will also give rise to some eigenvalues and there is again such a mother body there. And it, the, the picture looked very similar. And actually it's the same thing. The, the, the domain is the same, except there you have a uniform density uh, here for the droplet. Um, and here you have the measure that you come from the sphere. But there you, in this other model, you have a measure here on this, uh, 
on, on this mother body measure that was characterized also by an equilibrium problem, vector equilibrium problem. Um, and it has an algebraic structure behind it as well. So this, this situation is not the same because we have another density, but the, 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 the Riemann surface turned out to be the same one. And so, um, yeah, so we played with this, these equations and made the proper modifications. And then, yeah, then we guessed this, we made a guess of, of this form for the case R is two, right? And then we made another bold guess that it would be similar for any R, right? And then we were fortunate to prove it, yeah. Well, so, so that brings up another kind of a general question. And so what, um, what's known about what measures and, and I guess supports in the plane um, admit mother bodies? Yeah. Yeah, once you have an algebraic boundary, right? Uh, if your boundary is an algebraic curve, um, I'm not sure if, that, if, if there's a theorem like that, that there is a, a mother, but of course it depends also on what is the density here, right? That you have on, 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 your, on your droplet. But in the, in the standard case, when it's uniform measure on the droplet, um, then, um, yeah, then, yeah, I'm not sure if there's a real theorem there, but then, then I would, my guess would be that there is a, a mother body there, yeah. But again, I'm not sure if there is a, a, an actual a, a result in the literature about that. Okay, thank you. But the algebraic structure, that was the, the clue that we, the Riemann, I mean, the Riemann surface was, uh, gives, gives us this connection with the algebraic equations, right? And that, uh, that helped us as, as well. So then also, the, of course, the, the, the message is that these boundaries are always algebraic curves uh, that you, also on the sphere. So, so in your case, probably the existence of mother body just follows from the symmetry, rotational symmetry. So, so you, you, it's clear that you yeah. should have one, one dimensional average like that, just because right. the measure is- Exactly, yeah. Symmetry. So that's why we were successful. We, 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 know, we knew in advance where to look, right? In, in a more, if you remove the symmetry and then you may guess that these are just, now they, these become curves, right? I don't know where they go, right? And then, then it's a, free boundary problem so oh, yeah, then the, then the issue is get your hands on get say something about where the curves are right and then then you may this one maybe okay here we knew in advance where we could be certain that they would be on these uh, half lines right and then we didn't have to worry about that if you yeah my, my feeling is that you can still handle such cases and, and you come to curves that are, that are symmetric in some external field, right? Like an S, curves with S property, if, if you know, if you heard that the term. Then that came up also in rational approximation theory. Um, but now it will come in a vector equilibrium setting. So yeah, there's, uh, um, yeah, I'm involved in a project um, where we try to get our hands on, on that in a specific situation. Uh, but to find the right curves, is there an, a, a major issue? Yeah. I see, thank you. Uh, okay. Peter Dragnev here. Just wanted Hi, to uh, make a comment that uh, Alan Legg, he's in the audience and I have something about uh, the complement of the droplet that it's a quadrature Hi, domain. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm yeah. doing good, thanks. That's right, Peter and Alan. Yeah, so I, I, I should have mentioned it in the talk. Yeah, you have uh, a general result, right? That uh, whatever you get, uh, this, uh, yeah, this, let me put here, right? This is always the droplet itself or the complement. The, the complement of the droplet, right? Is a is a quadrature domain, right? 
yeah, so there's a lot of structure there, which is known. Um, yeah, so there's, yeah, you can do many things with these kind of problems, as we all know, right? That's why we like uh, point distributions in general, right? Is there a specific, um, is there a specific reason why the restriction here is, seems to just be to S2? Is it, is it, is it possible to do this on higher dimensional spheres um, or, or is it just that it's easier to, do, to show it on S2 and so that's why the focus is on S2 here? Yeah, no, it's, for us, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I, I have no, like, no clue what to do in higher dimensions because we really project onto the complex plane, right? And then we use complex analysis basically or mm -hmm. potential theory in the complex plane to, to do these problems. Um, then, yeah, uh, if you, I mean, this, this problem with these disjoint caps, I guess, Peter, this can be done in a general way, right? In general dimensions, I, I guess. So some things can be done, of course, in, in high dimensions, but um, a detailed analysis, including these phase transitions, right? I've never seen, um, I'm, I'm, uh, there may be something, but I, I'm not aware of results in on higher dimensional spheres. I see. Any more questions to Professor Carlos? Okay, then we can probably stop recording, right?